OK. Good morning, good evening, or good night, or you know, whatever time it is. Welcome to Orlando.net user group, or one tug as we call it. Uh, and welcome to our January talk. Today we'll have Jamie Taylor, and he is going to be talking about the 10 things he wish he knew before writing .NET on Linux. And this is one talk I'm looking forward to, having uh, now switched to using WSL extensively in the last uh, couple of years. Just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. And if you do not consent to being recorded, please uh, drop off at this point. A couple of reminders for our audience. Uh, please stay on mute. Uh, I know it's tough, but uh, when not talking or asking questions, which will you know, certainly provide the opportunities uh, during the talk, ask questions in chat after the talk. Feel free to come off mute and ask questions directly. But when not asking questions, please stay on mute because we do not want to interrupt the speaker with any background noise. And also, uh, you know, consider turning off your camera uh, during the presentation. We would love to have the speaker on uh, on camera, but other than that, generally, the uh, you know, it it doesn't look great in recording. So, if you can turn that off uh, again at the end of the talk, if you want to come on camera, that's fine. Uh, to ask a question, you can. Do uh, your raise a hand. You can use the raise a hand feature. It is available in most clients and uh, Teams clients, but some may not have it. Uh, but you can use that, or you can type a question directly into chat with prepend that with Q, so we know it's a question. Either way, if you ask a question, we'll make sure the speaker gets it. Uh, when called upon. Uh, come off mute and ask a question. So sometimes we may do that because you ask a question and we don't know, we want more explanation. So we may call you to explain your question further, or you know, uh, you can always use the chat window. Today's agenda will do the welcome and announcements. Uh, just again, reminding that the talk is being recorded and available on YouTube. And you had a YouTube link. If you don't have it, we will drop it in chat again. And then um, once you know, we will have Jamie talk about 10 things uh, I wish I knew before writing .NET on Linux. Jamie is a famous podcaster with the .NET, I'm sorry, .NET Core podcast. I think, I, sorry, there's like a lot of .NET podcasts I follow, so if I get your name wrong, excuse me for that. Uh, and he's talking about uh, running right. Linux apps on Windows servers, and uh, but also on Linux servers. So uh, basically, talking about the pitfalls that developers who don't have much experience can have with the open source Linux operating system. And uh, he will walk you through ten issues, which is all. I think uh, having a list of items is always good. And he is going to talk about 10 issues that he encountered while trying to build and deploy Linux X. So uh, I'm also interested, mainly interested in things like, you know, which Linux do I install? Because I, you know, I use Linux on WSL, but I just use the latest versions. Maybe, maybe I'm doing it wrong. But he'll also be asking, you know, talking about what pseudo is, which uh, is going to be interesting. Uh, this is your board that brings you this meeting and also Orlando Code Camp when we can have events again. Uh, to get in touch with us, these are the resources. So the best place to get in touch with us is on the website at onetug.net or on meetup at onetug.net slash meetup or Twitter, onetug.net slash Twitter or at onetug on Twitter. So those are the three major places, but you can also follow us on YouTube. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's always that way. 
if we do more meetups in the future and we post the videos, you get notified immediately that there's a new video. We do not spam your timeline, so please do subscribe. Upcoming meetings, uh, we have Feb 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, Al Rodriguez will talk about C Sharp and Pulumi, which also I'm looking forward to. We are always welcome sponsors. Uh, if you have any community announcements, feel free to uh, you know, come off mute and uh, announce it. Uh, basically, we are looking for things like you know, if you have a job posting, if you're looking for work, you, can, you could even put it in chat. Uh, or if there are any meetups or uh, conferences or open source projects or anything you'd like to uh, you know, bring forth, please, please do so right now. I will pause for a second to see if anyone has anything to add. I don't see anything in chat. Oh, I see some interesting conversations in chat, like where are you situated? That's always you know, good to hear that. Good to see people from different parts of the world. Thank you all for coming to this meeting. So with that, I hand it over to Jamie. Uh, Jamie uh, is a, uh, he's, as he calls himself, a dad mentor, uh, business owner, podcaster, uh, and he has extensive experience on the .NET stack, and he got uh, started with the, I think, the ZX Spectrum. Huh. I also got started with that machine. I think it was famous in certain parts of the world back in, you know, the 80s and uh, uh, so time period. So this is... Uh, it's great, Jamie. I think uh, we could we should catch up sometime about the ZX Spectrum. I can actually show you a website that has games from there. Uh, he's been podcasting for four years, .NET Core Podcast. I'm sorry for forgetting that name. Uh, but he also is uh, on other podcasts like Waffling, Tailors, and Tabs and Spaces. Feel free to talk about that, Jamie, when you start. Uh, he's a lover of Terry Pratchett. Oh, great. Awesome. Uh, and... Uh, he plays the guitar and can speak Japanese. Wow. And he is a Microsoft MVP from uh, December 2021. So recently minted MVP. Awesome. Welcome, Jamie. I will hand it over to you now and feel free to come off mute and start presenting. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to rearrange my screens. If you just bear with me a second and then I will. Uh, pick the correct desktop because I have three screens going on. So um, I guess first off, uh, before I do all the thanks and everything, can you all see and hear? Is is it all working? That's the yes, that's the yes, uh, we can. Jimmy, before you get started, I want to uh, you know uh, I have to do kind of a ritual. So here goes knock knock. Who's there? Pseudo. Pseudo who? Pseudo, open the door. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like that. It's very much like the the old XKCD comic of make me a sandwich. No, you make your own sandwich. Pseudo, make me a sandwich. <laughs> I like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um. So yeah. Uh. Thank you all. Uh. So much for um for for agreeing to have me on, uh, and to talk about uh Linux and .NET. I appreciate. For a lot of you, it's very 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 early in the morning. So. Thank you ever so much for sort of tuning in. Uh, I am looking at multiple screens, so if I'm looking across and you, you don't see where I'm looking, I, I do apologize. I will try and focus on looking into the camera. Um, thank you, Santosh and uh, Todd, for reaching out and uh, and asking me to, to do this. This is a, a great pleasure to talk to you all. And um, I'm going to be stumbling a little bit because I always fall over my words, so please bear with me. <laughs> okay. Um, so in the, in the intervening time between submitting uh, the the idea for this talk and actually finishing off writing it, I actually came up with a, a, a slightly different title because I originally wanted to talk about the 10 things um, that I wish I knew. And then I started writing all sorts of all sorts of slides and ended up with 12, 13, 25, 30. Uh, and so I took some time and cut them down and I've got it down to 12 
and I'm a excuse me, I'm a bit of a, a weird sort of cove, so I'm happy with with changing the title ever so slightly, giving you twelve things rather than ten. So I guess it's kind of like a bonus thing. But I guess before we move on to that first slide, I guess the 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 thing that I want to say before we even start is why Linux and why now, right? Um, a lot of us, uh, especially if we are not new to .NET development, a lot of us are primarily Windows users because uh, .NET Framework with a capital F was originally a Windows only technology. And so a lot of people were, it was just accepted that you would be a Windows user and you're writing .NET. But obviously over time, we've had, uh, if you don't know these things, these are the good, good things to Google. We've had a, a Mono, which was an attempt at making a, a black box re-implementation of .NET for Linux and Mac OS. Uh, we then had uh, Xamarin came off of the back of Mono. That's now a .NET technology. Mono, the team uh, and the technology were bought and brought into uh, .NET to make, to start the work into making it cross-platform. And now that it's cross-platform, it can run pretty much anywhere. You're not just limited to Windows machines anymore. You can run it on Mac OS. You can run it on Linuxes. I'm using the bunny quotes there because what is Linux, right? We'll, we'll cover that in a moment. You can run it on um, a Raspberry Pi. I have several of these sitting here. I could talk you through a few of those. You can run it. Um, in fact, I have a, an ebook reader. Now, this doesn't run .NET, but I have an ebook reader right here. That's running a version of Linux. Um, Pretty much anything that's embedded runs Linux. The machine that I'm using to talk to you all now is running a desktop Linux. So it's kind of important to know at least a little bit about them, enough to sort of Google and continue on. Um, and uh, and so what I thought with this is I'm trying to aim at the people who maybe have no experience of what a Linux is, or maybe have a little bit of experience and want to know some of the things to know if you're doing .NET development. And so if you know a lot about Linux, most of this is going to be um, uh, kind of cookie cutter and a little boring. So just to sort of set that uh, that expectation ahead of time. Um, so I do apologize if you find it a little bit boring. Uh, let's see if I can move on. Um, so firstly, do you even need to know Linux, right? Do you even need to? Uh, I would say that no, you don't need to know Linux. Um, I've been using Linux-based operating systems on my computers for around 10 years, and I didn't need to do it. I sort of explored one day. In fact, what happened was I was using uh, Windows 7, I think, and some really esoteric blue screen happened, and it was talking about uh, something to do with the, the ALU in my CPU. Something had gone wrong on a hardware level, and I couldn't get it to boot. And so I, uh, a friend of mine said, use my USB. He gave me a USB memory stick and it had a Linux operating system on it. And he said, boot into it. And if you can get it to run, then there's nothing wrong with your computer. It's probably the operating system. You may need to, to sort of pave it and reinstall. And on the USB, was a, there was a, an option to, to install or try it without installing. So I tried it out, kind of liked it. And I went, you know what? I've got nothing going on now. I'm on a bit of a vacation. I may as well install it. And if everything goes wrong, I can drop back to Windows. It's not a problem because I can just reinstall Windows. And I gave it a try. And yeah, I have right like in front of me, I've got the laptop I'm talking to you all with. I've got my desktop, which is underneath the desk. That's running Linux. These two are running Linux. And I have a Windows specific laptop for when I need to do Windows specific things. I've also got a Mac over here. So I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable jumping around. Um, but what I'm saying is it might be useful to you to, to you to know rather than, oh my goodness, I need to know all about the Linux, right? And this last point on the slide, um, you may be able to, I know I, this is entirely, your mileage may vary. You may be able to, if you can prove you have knowledge of Linux and you can work your way through it, you may be able to command a slightly higher salary. I don't know, that will rely entirely on your own situation and the types of work that you're going for. Um, I do know that a lot of the DevOps things uh, use Linux servers and uh, Docker and Podman and things like that. So it may be worth knowing about these things if success to you means being paid loads of money. Some people have different values of success. Some people think that lots of money is how you how you value it. Some people think that having all the knowledge in the world is how you value it. Whatever works for you, this may help you achieve that. Um, but then what I'd like to say in, with this next uh, slide is that um, I'm not going to teach you everything you're going to need to know. Um, and all of life is a lesson. And so 
uh, I want to start with some ancient wisdom from a, a Japanese swordsman called Yamaoka Teshu. And the full quote is not on here because I like to keep it kind of short. The full quote, and I'm reading from my notes here, is do not think that this is all there is. More and more wonderful teachings exist. The sword is unfathomable. Now, what he meant by the sword was whatever tool, technique, thing, knowledge that you are learning, there's always going to be a little bit more that you can learn if you want to. And so truly mastering something uh, will take lots and lots of time for you to actually uh, attain. And you shouldn't really be put off by that. You, uh, I like to celebrate the fact that I don't know everything because that means I've, I can I can learn something new, right? And so I try to, whenever I'm learning something, I try to uh, think of it in this way. I try to think of this quote when I'm learning something that more and more te- more and more things exist and you can't really know it all, but somebody will know enough to be able to teach you the next best thing. So I hope you don't mind the rather meme silly uh, thing that I've put on this slide here. But what is Linux? I mean, that's one of the points that we want to we want to reach, right? Um, I do have in my in my slide notes, and I can share the deck afterwards. That's not a problem. Um, that uh, <laughs> that my ally is the force. It is a powerful ally, and it life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us which is from um, one of the Star Wars movies. It's Yoda talking about the Force. And the reason I say that is because quite literally Linux is everywhere, right? At my desk where I am sitting, I've got, like I say, I've got two laptops, one running Linux. I've got a NAS that I've built, which runs Linux. I've got a Bluetooth speaker, which is likely running a version of Linux. I've got my e-reader. I've got a couple of Raspberry Pis dotted about. What I'm saying is they're all around you, right? And it is that penguin thing. If you've ever seen Linus the Penguin, and if you're not sure about Linus the penguin, you should Google it. You'll see a little a little penguin just sort of sitting there chilling. That's the unofficial mascot of, of Linux. If you have an Android device, it you've been running Linux all this time, and maybe you knew, maybe you didn't know. Not everybody does, and that's fine. We can celebrate n- knowing and not knowing if you want. Um, uh, pretty much anything that runs IoT runs Linux. Um, and... And that is largely because it's free to use. It's there for you to use. You can use it for whatever you want. And so a lot of people who are trying to start startup businesses, get some funding really quickly and get something out to market, rather than writing their own operating system from the ground up, they can take off the shelf components to build something, throw a Linux kernel on it, make some changes and boom, there you go. You've got it out there in the world. In the world. And so this this helps us to sort of get started that whole idea of an of of a fast iteration uh is helped by the fact that linux exists and then even then right linux isn't actually the real name of it it's actually gnu linux gnu linux um, and some people say that gnu stands for gnu's not unix but whatever right that's just some background knowledge so linux is is the kernel of the operating system kind of like how um windows has the nt kernel and Mac has the XNU kernel, it's kind of the same. Everything else builds on top of it. Everything builds on top of that kernel. Uh, and that and the kernel manages all of the hardware and uh, time slicing and memory acquisition, all that kind of stuff. Device drivers sit on top of it, file systems sit on top of it, that kind of thing. So Linux itself isn't something that you can easily run by itself. You need a whole heap of stuff piled on top of it to make something work. So how do you go about getting a Linux, right? Um, so that's that's the most important question. If you are new to Linux and you don't know what it is, where are you going to go? Right? What are you going to do? Right? You may even do the Zoidberg One Linux, please, which is what's on this slide. And the problem is, and if I show you over here, I've got some resources. There are literally, if I zoom in on here, hopefully you can see this window as well. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Linuxes. Each one of these lines on the screen is a separate Linux, for want of a better phrase, right? There are hundreds of them. So how do you pick? How do you choose? Nobody can choose, right? It's so difficult to choose. So what I would do, my own personal opinion, is you go with the most famous ones. So that's Fedora, OpenSUSE, Red Hat Enterprise, Linux, Debian, or rather Debian, or Ubuntu. And my personal uh, choice would be to go with Ubuntu because it was designed from the ground up. The very first version of Ubuntu was designed to be the most user-friendly thing that they could make. And you don't even need to get a Linux, right? 
I mentioned earlier on, I have a number of Raspberry Pis. Yeah, these are great. I've got like five of these hidden around the house. I've I've disconnected these ones so I could show you them. I've got another one in this box as well, um, and they're great for. Uh, it's, if you get one of these, uh, I, they're about twenty five dollars, and you just get the the circuit board and a and an SD card, a mini SD card, and the software is already on there, right? So all you need to do is plug in power, um, a monitor, and a keyboard and a mouse and get it on the network and you're done. You've got a Linux on the network. And in fact, you don't even need to plug it in via the network because they have Wi-Fi built onto them. And you don't even need a keyboard and mouse because they have Bluetooth built onto them. This one is one of the, the, the newer ones. This is a Raspberry Pi 4. This has a Bluetooth chip and a Wi-Fi chip built on. This one's a Raspberry Pi 3. It doesn't have Bluetooth, so I've bought a USB Bluetooth device and I can get that up and going in seconds. You just plug in a power supply. Most mobile phone chargers will power one of these. So you don't even need to buy the power supply if you're willing to sacrifice a mobile phone charger whilst you're working with it. And the great thing about this is you get a new toy, right? There's all sorts you can do with these. Um, this one in the in the dark case is a local playback only Kodi box. So this sits under my TV and is connected to uh, over the network to a server which has a whole bunch of videos on it and pictures and mu music and all that kind of stuff and i can go through it and i'll go right i want to watch this today and the the bluetooth receiver is for a remote control this one is my music playback device so i have a personal um on the network almost like a spotify uh, using a, a piece of software called jellyfin which is a wonderful um piece of media playback written in net and runs on linux so you know, if you get one of those, you could try those out. You can set them up with like RetroPie and play video games if you want. There's all sorts that you can do with them. So you can get one of those. That will ship with it. That's brilliant. Or you can go over to websites like uh, copy.sh slash v86. And on here, you, you can see, I don't know how easy it is to see. Let me zoom in a little bit. There's a number of different operating systems listed on the left. And literally all you do is you pick one, let's say, I don't know, Windows 98, as an example. I know this is about Linux, but Windows 98, you've got yourself a Windows 98 box. And it's a full Windows 98 box, right? It actually runs. The only thing is that they they ask that you hit exit before you just close the, the screen, right? I apologize if that was super loud. But you can go, oh, let's boot into Arch Linux. And you've got yourself a Linux box right there. It is the command line but you've got something you can play with. So you don't even have to buy anything. You can run it inside the browser and get used to it. You can say, oh, LS, list all the files. Have we got anything? We've got some files. Oh, brilliant. We've got some assembly files, some C, some JavaScript. Let's just see what um, hello.js looks like. What is that? So does a console log hello world? So I could run that, right? So that gives me an experience of sort of playing around without ever having to worry about breaking my machine or installing anything. The other thing, of course, is that you can install WSL. Uh, Santosh mentioned it earlier on. You can install it on, on top of your Windows if you have Windows uh, 10 version 2004 or higher, or indeed Windows 11. And there's actually a version of WSL now that allows you to boot GUI-based applications that run on Linux in Windows, right? So that's even better. So you don't even have to go away from Windows to get an idea of what a Linux is. But if you do want to go away from Windows to try them out, I'd recommend Ubuntu. And what you can do is you can go to the website. If I go to the Ubuntu website, which I have here, I'm going to say I'll accept because I'm in the I'm in the UK. And we have to accept all of the uh, the things. I'm going to go to download, and there's an Ubuntu desktop. So that's that's what I want to run if I want to run it on a desktop computer. Ubuntu server if I want to run it on a server, and it gives me a download option. I click that. It will give me the correct one. You can, you may be able to see at the bottom of the screen. It's picked the architecture. It knows what CPU I'm using. Dump it onto a USB. Boot into the USB, and you can run it without touching your computer. You don't have to worry about replacing anything on your computer. So that's a great way to get started. And then once you've got it on the USB, you can say, "Okay, I'm happy. I've backed everything up, installed it on my computer, and it will wipe your computer and install Ubuntu." Problem with that, of course, is that if you haven't backed everything up, you lose everything. There's also a great thing. I keep reaching for this USB because this one has an app on it called. This was the one I didn't get uh, uh, on Google yet uh, for the for the notes. But the the app here is called Ventoy. What you do with this one 
is you plug the USB in, you run a shell script or a, an XE if you're on Windows, and it sets up a bunch of partitions. You drag and drop ISO files onto here. You can see here someone's put a Windows 10 one on there. Someone's put a Windows 7 one on there. And then further down, you can see Arch Linux. You drop the ISOs on there as ISO files, and then plug your USB and reboot your computer, and you can run any of these without having to install them. So the Windows ones you do have to install, but it's a great way of sort of trying them out. So you can see here someone's fired up the Windows 10 installer. They've gone into Ubuntu and they're able to try it without installing, or they can install it if they want. And the same thing with, uh, I guess this is Deepin and CentOS. There's lots of different Linuxes. I'll share all of these links afterwards. That's not a problem. But the point I'm getting at is it's become really super easy to actually try these things out. And each of those different Linuxes are called distributions or distros for short, because you get the kernel and you get loads of other applications and packages on top of that. So Windows, you in this instance, you could think of Windows as a distribution of the NT kernel and a bunch of stuff to make Windows work, right? Um, so if there are this many, how are they different or are they different, right? And this is where I'm going to sit on the fence because this is a very tricky question to answer. Uh, without going into loads and loads of details. Essentially, all of the different Linux distributions are kind of the same. They all have a version of the Linux kernel on there. Some may have the very latest. So I believe this week it's uh, this week or next week is the release of uh, Linux kernel 5.13. Uh, some may be on old versions uh, that are maybe 5.2. Some are even uh, Linux 2.6. Uh, 2.6 was released in around the 2000. Uh, time frame, I believe. And so the core part of it, the kernel, is pretty much the same. It's just everything else that's piled on top. Um, some uh, some distributions ship with an, an Office suite called OpenOffice. Some ship with an Office suite called LibreOffice. Some have Firefox as their default browser. Some have Chrome as their default browser. It literally is which bits do you want to choose, right? Um, and because of that, some of those differences are indeed just cosmetic. Um, some are based on what are called the package manager, which is how you want a way to install um, software. And some of the different, some of them are different due to licensing. From an end user's perspective, if you're running it on your computer, there's very little difference. It just looks different, right? And then you swap out your your desktop wallpaper, and it looks almost like any other computer, right? Um, some folks prefer. We'll talk about them in a moment. But there's lots of different ways to install software. Some people prefer using APT. Some prefer using YUM. Some prefer using RPM. These are all words that you can Google if you want. I have a slide on them in a moment. But they're essentially all solving the same thing. How do we do a desktop op operating system or indeed a server operating system using the Linux kernel? Um, the one thing to point out, though, um, I did mention a few slides earlier. If I go back one, I said Fedora. Yeah, Fedora and a Red Hat Open uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the enterprise version. You would you pay for support for that one. You pay for access to that one. But it is the enterprise version of Fedora. Fedora is quite literally at the bleeding edge of everything. Every time a new package is released, it goes on to Fedora and Arch Linux first, and then other distributions adopt it. As such. Um, installing .NET on Linux can be a little difficult if you're on Fedora. Now, this is I'm using I'm using information from two or three weeks ago. Um, Fedora itself is difficult to install Linux on be, because they have this idea of reproducible builds. They want to build it themselves, not have a binary supplied by Microsoft. That's my understanding as of two or three weeks ago. It may have changed. So. The other thing to consider as well is if you're going to do .NET on Linux, you need to make sure that the tools you're going to use are available. And the easiest way to do that is to search uh, fedora.net install, like quite literally that. And it will say, hey, how do you install it? And you've got the steps for installing it. I know that uh, I tried out uh, the latest version of Fedora um, in November, and I couldn't install VS Code. So that. I like to use VS Code, so I couldn't, for me, that was a deal breaker. For you, that may not be a deal breaker. And so it's worth doing a little bit of Googling and learning how to do it. And what's great about these is, I mean, A, it's the Microsoft documentation, and B, it literally gives you the commands to do it, right? And and it's it's walking you through the steps. So that's pretty, that's, that's something to be aware of is that unlike Windows, when, you know, if, you're, if you want to install an application, you download an XE, you run it and it, it will start working, right? 
the, there's a few caveats involved with installing software on different Linuxes, and each one handles it differently. I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and yeah, you could, because I've said earlier on, it, from a user's perspective, it's just like Windows. It's just an operating system, right? Visually, yes, but there are some differences. Um, so uh, Windows and Linux distros can be completely different, but they can be very similar. Uh, for instance, when the Windows 11 user interface was first showed off, a lot of people went, oh, that looks like uh, the Linux interface for XFCE. And so a lot of people would say, oh, that looks pretty similar. If I'm used to using XFCE, then I can use that. So for instance, uh, where are we? Lin Mint, Linux Mint has a wonderful user interface that is very similar to uh, anyone who's used Windows. It has a simple window. It has a start menu, but they call it the super menu. Um, presumably, you know, in case anyone from Microsoft says you can't say that, or indeed some people in the Linux community are very anti-Microsoft, so they don't want it to be called start. I'm not going to discuss that. That's for them to discuss themselves. And as you can see, it looks very much like a modern Windows. And, and in fact, a lot of people say that if you're coming from uh, Windows 98, Windows uh, XP, maybe even Windows 7, Linux Mint is a good place to try and start because it looks a lot like what you're used to. Um, if you are, I didn't get this, I'm going to have to get it again. Endeavor, whoops, Endeavor OS, there we go, whoops. Oh gosh, don't ever do anything live, folks. <laughs> I've ended up on the search, Endeavor OS, there we go. Uh, don't do things live. Um, so Endeavor OS, the reason I bring this one up is it looks and feels a lot like Mac OS. So if you're, do, we, do they have a screenshots page? Some some distros have screenshots. Some some don't. Um, but yeah, it, it, this one is is built to look and feel a lot like uh, Mac OS. So if you're a Mac user, this one may be a good place to start. It's it's worth a try, right? So I'm going to drag that over there so that I've got all of my uh, windows in order. Um, and so they are they are a little different. Um, the for instance the file system, right? I am going to remote onto. I wonder if this is going to work. Nope. <laughs> Never do anything live, folks. There we go. So I'm now remoting onto one of my, it's not one of these. I have another Raspberry Pi that I use um, to um, block ads and tracking. And so I can uh, I can go LS and I can see some things. I can go, go out to there. And so the file system on a Linux machine, let me move this into the middle and maybe see if I can change the, whoops, see if I can change the uh, the font for you. There we go. That's a little better. So there are no drive letters. That's one of the first things to, to know about the differences between a Linux or a Unix, a Mac OS, and Windows is that there are no drive letters. So everything, this is the root of the file system, the forward slash, right? And so we're looking at um, what the what the system looks like. Let me do that again just to get it formatted nicely. And so all of my drives that are on this device will be in dev. So if I look in the dev folder, I can see there's lots of devices that are running on this machine, right? If I want to have access to one of those devices, I can talk to this. Because it's a Raspberry Pi, I have a GPIO chip that I can talk to. I have, uh, what else do we have? We've got a touch, we've got a, a TTY terminal. We've got all sorts of things. We can poke at dev random and get a random number out. Um, the great thing about um, the Linux and Unix operating systems is that quite literally everything is a file. Uh, it's become a bit of a meme in, in Linux, but um, everything is a file because uh, that's just the way it works. You write to the file that you, or you read from the input file and that input file will then communicate with the driver to get you the information that you want. And so you may go to, uh, let's do an LS again. We may go to uh, LS bin, right? LS bin, so the bin folder is essentially the and the same as your program files folder. This is where all the binaries go for all of your applications that you're going to run. And so, you know, you may be able to look through this now and see all the applications I've got installed. So we've got the ability to remove directories. We've got the ability to do bzip. We could do cat, which allows us to um, show files, the contents of files on screen, make directories. We've got systemd installed. All of these different applications allow me to do different things. I can I can rimraf if I want. So rimraf, I won't run it. 
Rimrath is one of the most dangerous commands you can run on a Linux machine because you, you can go like that and delete the everything on the machine. And as long as you uh, pass the admin check, it will just get, will go, okay, and it'll delete everything. That's called RIMRAF, R-M-R-F, RIMRAF. Some people refer to it like that. And what's great about uh, Linux is that the, the, the different security mod, uh, model. So if you've used a Windows machine and you want to do something as an admin, you get that annoying pop-up that nobody reads, that everybody finds the yes button, clicks yes, I know what I'm doing, let me do it. Well, on Linux, the equivalent is, is this command, uh, sudo or sudo, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It stands for substitute user do operation. So I can substitute my user for the administrator and type in my administrator password and do a command. So one of the most dangerous commands you could do is sudo rimraf on slash. Remember slash is like the root of your C drive. And even though it's running, you can delete everything on there. So I'm going to delete that before I run that because <laughs> that could be a bit of a, a bit of a problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this over here and I'm going to exit from my shush session. So don't need that now. The other thing as well is that um, Windows binaries and Linux binaries are completely different. So you can't just just drag an XE from Windows and double click it and run it. There is a thing called Wine, which is a backronym for why uh, I believe Win Wine is not an emulator. And uh, with that, you can say, hey, run this XE and it will try its hardest to actually run it. What it does from my understanding is it translates all of the Windows system calls into Linux system calls. So there's a whole compatibility layer for talking to the screen using DirectX, which is what if you've heard of uh, Proton, which is what the Steam Deck is going to use, not the Stream Deck, the Steam Deck. That's going to use Proton to be able to boot games onto a Linux system. And um, over the last few years, Valve have made huge strides in that. Almost uh, every game that is built for Windows that they sell on Steam at least boots. Not all of them run, but at least a, a large amount of them boot. You can use Wine to run Windows applications in that sort of weird position where you can't find an alternative for your Linux, um, Linux machine. The problem, of course, is that if you're running anything created by Adobe or any of the Office suite from Microsoft, they tend to not work. But other things have a bit of a wobbly support. Um, there is a website, I believe, Wine HQ. Let's find it. And on Wine HQ, you can actually search for an application and you can say, uh, I want to run, uh, let's see, um, Word. I'm going to type in Word and it's going to tell me that I can't run it. Install Word, install, those are all ads. Here we go, Microsoft Word. So it tells you how to run Microsoft Word on your Linux machine. And it tells you whether it's obsolete, whether it works or not. And if you desperately need to run those, you can run those. So let's move that over there and get rid of that one. We'll go back to here. And so that exists as this sort of get out clause for, whoops, I've moved over to Linux and I can't, I need to run this XE and I can't run this XE. And so, Earlier on, I said that there are lots of different ways to, to install and manage your applications on a Linux system. There's APT, which is usually used by Debian, um, RPM, which is used by uh, Fedora, I believe, Yum, which is used by uh, Arch Linux, Flatpak, AppImage, Snap, DLLs, all sorts of stuff. And there are hundreds and hundreds of different ways to run the different apps on Linux. This isn't a .NET thing. This is just a how do I install things thing. So you might see the commands for run RPM install or APT install or flat pack get from, you know, these kinds of things. And so this is, it's good to know that these exist. Depending on the distribution you choose, different ones of these will be available. If you choose an Ubuntu based um, distribution, you'll have Snap because that's an Ubuntu technology. You'll have Flatpak, you'll have App Image, and you'll have APT. If you run a Fedora or Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you'll have RPM, and you'll have Flatpak, and you'll have App Image. So it's all about which things and how easy it is to install. All of them are solving the same problem, but in slightly different ways. And this is the thing with Linux is that everybody has hundreds of different ways to run things. And so these are the ways that you're going to need to know to install things. If you've used Docker, you've used Linux. Maybe. <laughs> um, there, there was a period of time, and they still do exist, where you could have Windows containers within Docker. 
Um, uh, the the biggest problem with these is that you can't run Windows containers and Linux containers on the same machine at the same time, at least as far as I know. They, they may have changed recently. Um, I don't tend to run Windows containers, so I don't really know so much about those. Um, I accept to say that Windows containers are really rather huge. They're around a gigabyte each, and then you install your app on top of that. And so if you want that fast dev loop of shut down the thing, destroy the thing, start it back up, as long as you've got that one gigabyte of stuff cached, you can actually pull that back and get it. But if you don't have that one gigabyte of stuff cached, all bets are off, right? And so um, it's usually a good idea to have a Linux Docker container. And a Linux Docker container is just like a Windows. Uh, sorry, it's just like a, a Linux machine, except uh, that you can uh, spin it up and shut it down whenever you want, and that you need to run Docker to be able to do it. Um, the the crazy thing that I think personally, personal opinion, not the opinion of anyone else, um, is that there is a, a ridiculous amount of wizardry has gone into getting Docker to run on Windows. Um, because, you know, it's not designed to run a Linux. Uh, it wasn't originally designed to run a Linux operating system underneath everything and expose everything out. Um, but you can you can use Docker if you don't want to run a Linux. You will be running a Linux, but you won't see it. And so that's that's a way of running Linux as well, if you wanted. Um, so what, so we've talked a lot of the stuff we've talked about is kind of what is Linux. We're coming to some of the .NET specific stuff. What about the CLI, right? You've seen me messing around with the CLI here. I've got uh, show me my uh, my current working directory. It's here. Uh, let's see what's in here. We've got some code in there. We've got some files in there. Um, you know, I can I can clear that out. Whatever. Do I need to know all of these commands? And I will say no. Do you need to know all the commands on Windows? Well, maybe you do need to know the commands for um, .NET stuff uh, because the command line is built from the ground up for dot, for modern .NET. So that's .NET 5, .NET 6, .NET Core. It was built from the ground up to be used by Linux people and to be automated um, because uh, because what, what what they wanted to do is to make it super easy for you to go .NET help get all of your help and see all of the commands. Um, but then to also then be able to go, uh, let's have a look, where are we? So we're gonna go into, uh, yep, and we've got, we've got talks in there, okay. So they want to be, I haven't got the code to be able to run it for you. Uh, let me check in, don't ever do a live demonstration, everyone. What have we got? Oh, brilliant, we've got Converter in there, excellent. So this is an app, I was talking to Santosh before we went live about I'm building an app to help my brother, who is a professional podcast editor, to do a bunch of things. Now, this particular app is a .NET app. So I can go into the source, oh gosh, I can go into the source directory and I can say, okay, cool, uh, do a .NET build. I haven't had to load anything, right? I've not I've not loaded a an IDE, I've not loaded any kind of software, it's all in here. And if I wanted to, I could edit it in here, right? I'm not going to, but let's see what files I've got. I can go nano, program.cs. Ta-da! I'm actually editing my .NET code without actually running any kind of application, which is pretty cool. But the great thing about this, the CLI for .NET is that it is built to be able to make those CI CD pipelines super easy to build because all you're doing is issuing these commands. You're saying .NET clean, and then it cleans it, and you may say .NET clean and .NET build. So what I'm doing here is I am saying, if I can type it correctly, I'm saying .NET clean, and if it completes, run .NET build. And so it will clean, it will complete, and then it will build. How great is that? All right, there's one command. But I will say that VS Code and Rider are your friends. So if I open code, you can see it'll be rather small. So this app wraps around FFmpeg, right? It's not doing anything clever. It's just wrapping around FFmpeg. And I can use... I can use breakpoints. I can write code in here. I can do it with Rider as well. I've got Rider installed, so I can do. I can. I can run everything in here. I can run everything in Rider. What I'm saying is, you don't have to live in the command line. I can. I can build from here. So I can hit F5, and if I supply the right things, it will start building my application, which is wonderful. And so I don't have to worry about that. So you don't really need to know the CLI. 
but you can't but it, it's a great value add right because it will help you with your devops practices and speeding up that dev loop you can even do i believe dot net watch and then build i believe and what will happen there so that's that's done a build it's then going to watch and wait for me to make changes to those files and as soon as i make changes it will start it will start building it so let's show that off all right so we'll bring up code here and i'm going to say dot net watch build it does a build it sits and waits and then visual studio code complains it hasn't got some stuff then i'm just going to add this is a comment whoops is a comment just to change the file so that you can see and when i hit save watch picks that up it says hey you've you've made a change i'll rebuild it for you which is wonderful right because then that increases that it decreases that dev loop as soon as i hit uh, yeah, i hit save it rebuilds again and there's even something in uh .NET, uh 6 the modern .NET, that is worth looking into called .NET hot reload which can do that but without having to stop and start your application it can halt it rebuild it put it back where it was and then you can continue on and the app will still run and it will go straight back to where it was which is kind of it's not a linux specific thing but that's a wonderful thing that you can do so talking about .NET specifically on um or on linux there's loads of stuff that doesn't work right uh .NET outside of windows doesn't support the uh doesn't support registry because registry doesn't exist doesn't support native guis but that apparently according to the people i've spoken to outside of microsoft that is coming um and uh, it doesn't support windows based authentication so there is a thing called uh, .NET maui which is coming which will allow you to build native gui apps for linux but that the linux portion of it isn't coming yet um from what i've been told the idea is there will be a number of interfaces that you can use and those interfaces will allow you to uh will will allow anyone to draw a window on screen and interact with it and what i've what i've been told by people and this is public domain knowledge this isn't anything super secret the idea is those interfaces will be released to the public and uh, the dotnet devs may ask for help implementing them on linux because linux doesn't have one way of drawing windows right it has about 12 de bajillion different ways <laughs> of drawing windows and depending on how you've got your system configured you may not have all of those different ways to draw windows and so it becomes an np uh, difficult task right it becomes difficult to solve so not everything works but a lot of stuff does in fact a huge amount of stuff does if you're relying on dotnet specific stuff then uh, sorry if you're relying uh, on windows specific stuff uh, indeed, yes. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, badly pronounce your name. Uh, I'm guessing Stefan. Um, I apologize for, uh, for for mispronouncing your name. Stefan has said in the chat there the principal context for AD authentication that will be missing on on uh, on on Linux. Uh, there is an an AD server, but it doesn't have everything that Windows AD has, right? Um, and so if you need Windows specific things it's worth having a windows machine that you can communicate with um, to actually talk with to get those windows specific uh, applications and things that you need this this fits really well in the the idea of segregation of concerns right and uh, microservices uh, i'm saying microservices so that you can get the uh, the seo buzz from that santosh um, but it helps with those kinds of things you're separating out those concerns you have a one service that does windows stuff you talk to it and say hey can you do the windows thing it says brilliant here's your response and another thing as well that i've noticed that is a top tip of mine um, not everyone does this, but uh, if we go back into the code here that I have, the, the my converter app, and I do uh, path dot oh gosh, path dot join. I'm sure I'm using path dot join. Okay, I'm not using path dot join. Bad example, but um, some people in <laughs> good shout there, Satosh, tagging the video with microservices. Some people in .NET land when they're doing uh, let's actually do this right so in .NET land what you can do if you want to access something from disk is you can say uh, my path is bar bar path oh geez i can't type honest let me get rid of these i might say see uh, my directory my direction or something right the problem with that is uh, it equals that the problem with that of course is that this path only works on windows not just because i've used the c colon backslash but because i've used the backslash 
select a subder, sub subder, right? And the problem with this is, like I say, it uses the backslash. So if you were to run this and say, go get this file from this path, it wouldn't work because on a Linux or a Mac, you don't use backslashes. So what I do is I do path.join and then pass in a set of uh, paths you want to join. So you may go uh, my direct directory direction, my direction, whoops, sub, whoops, sub, dir. I can't type. This is why a lot of people don't do these live, right? <laughs> and then sub dir. And whoops. And the, the reason for this, oh, I put a dot, that's why. So I go var path, get rid of that, put an equals in here, get rid of this. So the reason that this exists is because uh, the, the .NET devs thought about this and they knew that on different locales, you may not use backslash. On, for instance, I know that on Japanese machines, they use the yen symbol there instead of the backslash. And so using path.join, what it does is it goes and inspects the, the, uh, the operating system it's running on, the locale, and a whole bunch of other stuff to find out where um, what kind of system you're running on. And this command will produce the same as that on a Windows machine. And so that's that's one of the things that tripped a lot of people up. It tripped me up, definitely. Um, and what you can do with these is you can also do um, like special, is it special directory, I think? No, I can't remember the name of it. Oh, it's directories, that's right. Directory dot, uh, is it special? Oh, I, I can't remember the name of it. Well, I can sit here and Google it if you want, but it's not interesting to watch me Google something. You can say, use this special directory, use the user path, use the root of the hard drive, use um, the temporary directory that's used by uh, Windows or whatever, uh, or, or indeed the Windows path, right? All of these are built in. And so that's why I'm saying by watch your path, right? Because when you when you use path.join, .NET will figure out how to join those things up for you, which is wonderful. Now, the difficult thing is debugging. How do I debug my app on Linux? I know how to do it on Windows because I've got Visual Studio. Visual Studio is wonderful. It has this wonderful suite of tools. It's got all of these things. It works almost like a, uh, a Swiss Army knife, right? It's got the spoon. It's got the can opener. It's got a mobile phone. It hasn't got a mobile phone. I'm just being silly. But how do I then debug on, on Linux if I'm used to running on Windows? Um, well, if you're on Linux, then WinDBG, which is the Windows debugger, doesn't exist. But there is something called SOS. So if I go to here, there is something called SOS, which exists to use uh, with LLDB. So if you want to debug a running application, you can use SOS to actually inspect a running application, get a, a trace out of it, and run through that. In fact, what I would recommend, if you're interested in running .NET on Linux and all of the debugging things, is I'd recommend getting a book called .NET Core in Action. It was written by Dustin Metzger. Now, this book was written in the .NET Core 1.0 days, but released in the .NET Core 2 days. So a little, some of the information is a little out of date, but what's great about this book is it has a 20-page chapter on debugging in .NET across Windows and Linuxes. And it's... It, the information that's in there is way out of scope for this talk, but I would definitely recommend getting it. Um, you can get the ebook version, the, uh, the print book version, whatever works for you, but I would recommend looking into it. But you don't actually have to get the book because I'm going to share with you some of the, the tools that you can use. So debugging.net on Linux used to be super hard, but it's not so hard now because there are lots of tools. There's SOS, there's .NET dump, so you can get a memory dump of an application that's running that is then compatible with other um, uh, dump uh, root systems. So you can dump the memory, throw it into LLDB or into WinDBG, and it will just it will read through it. Um, and you can get a GC dump, which is the heap dump rather than just the actual uh, content. Um, and you can even do tracing. So if your application is already running, you can run this global tool trace and attach it to a process and you will see all of the steps that are happening. So there's lots and lots of ways that you can debug your application. Of course, you can also in Visual Studio Code go like that and put a breakpoint in. You can put a breakpoint in, hit F5 and run your application and you're off to the races. 
right? And it will stop here. You get the full debugging experience. Um, and so you don't really need a huge amount of tools to do it. But if your if your um, path takes you down the 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 if your uh, if your application takes you down the path of having to trace through things and look at memory dumps, then this is a great set of tools to use. I've got all of these links, and I will happily share them after. That's not a problem. Um, and so it depends on what your use case is. It used to be hard, but it's getting way better. Um, and you can use, uh, like I say, you can use Rider, you can use Visual Studio, uh, rather Visual Studio Code, um, or you can use all of these these uh, bits and pieces. Now, when it comes to getting support, now I'm not necessarily talking about support for .NET on Linux, but support for Linux, right? If you're learning something new, then you have to, you know, you're going to have to learn some stuff and pick up some support somewhere, read some documentation, maybe watch some YouTube videos. Some of the Linux distributions are really enterprisey. I realize that we're running low on time. I only have this. This is the last slide, so I'll try and make this quick. <laughs> some Linux are enterprisey, so Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You have to pay to get the support for that. But most of the Linux distributions have completely free uh, support forums and documentation, and they have other companies that write documentation for them. If you're ever stuck with a Linux question, go have a look at DigitalOcean. Right? I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to convince you to to use DigitalOcean. Ocean. There we go. I'm not trying to convince you to use DigitalOcean, but what's great about DigitalOcean is they have these uh, this tutorial section, and quite literally anything you can think of that you want to run on Linux, they've got a documentation for it. But they also have, uh, like, here's how to create a REST API with Insomnia on a Linux box, and it talks you through how to build it, right? But there's even things like uh, you know, styling stuff, how to install. Uh, I installed. Uh, are there techniques not to worry about? There's the straw techniques that span across the straws. Good question, Santosh. I will come to that in a moment. Um, and and yeah, so there's there's loads and loads of documentation that is worth digging into. DigitalOcean are great at this, and they tend to hire people and pay people to produce the documentation. So the documentation really well, really well written. I would always recommend starting with an Ubuntu or a derivative of Ubuntu, so Linux Mint or uh, Pop! OS, which is what I'm running at the moment, because the support is just that good. It is so good. No matter what you are struggling with, someone else has already um, has already solved it and written about it. And and to Santosh's question here about uh, techniques that where you don't have to worry about the distro, most of the, because the Linux kernel itself and you're communicating with it using the, um, using the command line, you're communicating with the Linux kernel itself, most of the techniques will work across all of them. So if you find a way to fix something on an Ubuntu machine, it will more than likely work on a Fedora, but you may have to change one or two of the commands. So let's say you have a problem with your Ubuntu machine, you have to install some software. Well, you could take that same command and run it on an Ubuntu, but change EPT for RPM, and it will work and it will install because they're just that good, right? The support is literally there, right? And uh, and that's that's why I would start there. We we'll start with an Ubuntu because Ubuntu is designed from the ground up to be user friendly. And if you do get stuck, you can go to the Arch Wiki. Now Arch or Arc, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, is a distribution of Linux, and this it, it's known as Linux the hard way, right? Because you literally have to build everything yourself. You start with a command line interface, and you start installing packages and building things for your machine. But what's great about this is on the Arch Wiki. You can there there are there are things for doing stuff in no matter what distribution you're using. So for instance, if I got frequently asked questions, there's likely something like, uh, how do I? Yeah, I've got an error with this package. What do I do? Well, you can go and report a bug if you want, or you can, oops, or you can uh, search the forums or things like that. So there's a lot of um, the Arch Wiki is really good for looking at um, how do I fix this problem with my Linux. And I don't know what Linux I'm using. One good application to install, I suppose, would be NeoFetch. Oh, it's not even installed. Okay, let's do it live, right? Let's install it live. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. What's the worst that could happen? Whoops. Oh gosh. What's the absolute worst that could happen? Sudo apt install NeoFetch. We're gonna install that. Please insert your password. You've all got the key loggers running, right? Oh. No, let's try it again. 
And one of them super complex passwords that uh, requires me to get it wrong all the time. So this is me installing. Hey, it's Jay-Z. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to install this thing. This is me literally installing something. Here it goes. It's going to install. It grabs some packages. It does the thing. And then I can go NeoFetch. What's great about NeoFetch is it tells you everything about your computer. It tells you the operating system you're running, maybe the model number of your computer, which kernel, how long you've been running it for, how much RAM you've got, where are we, how much RAM you've got. It gives you a bunch of color patches. So then you can check your color co uh, um, configuration and and the CPU and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really useful for identifying what your computer is running. That's a great way. Uh, I used to use, when I was on Windows, I used to use DXDiag to get this information. But I could do this, get the same information from a command line. So why not? And so how do you pick one? Ubuntu, 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 right? That's where I would start. Ubuntu is super easy to get on with. You plug it in, you get it running. It has drivers for pretty much everything. Or indeed, get yourself a Raspberry Pi because they're super cheap, loads of fun to play with, and you can get on with them. There's even, I have in here, a Raspberry Pi 400, which is a Raspberry Pi inside of a keyboard. So I don't even need to buy a keyboard. With this one, it, it has uh, a keyboard, a mouse, a uh, power supply, and a whole bunch of other uh, components to get it up and running. So you, all you need for this one, it even has the power supply, so all you need for this one is a screen. That's it. Uh, this one's a little bit more expensive than, than the standard Raspberry Pi, but it gets you started, right? And you don't have to touch your own computer. Or indeed, you could go on, uh, what did we say it was? It was uh, all the way over here, copy.sh, and run an operating system inside of your browser in JavaScript land. So you don't even have to run it. You don't have to run everything new on your computer. If you are looking at different distros, pick one that has been around for a long time. The longer that they have lived for, the more support they will be. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a, a good way to sort of get started. And unless you really, really know what you're doing, unless you really, really know what you're doing, I would avoid using Kali Linux. Kali Linux is great if you're doing uh, network stuff. So if you're doing like network penetration, um, Kali Linux is great for that. But there's almost no support for this, almost no documentation. There is some, but not a lot. But that's because the designers and, and supporters of the Kali Linux project want you to buy a course on how to use Kali Linux, right? Um, but that that is not to say that Kali Linux is any way bad. It's just really, really detailed. So unless you know what you're doing, I would avoid using that one. I'm going to put this window here. And so... Uh, that's where I would start. Ubuntu, great place to start. And you can install that on WSL. I believe it's just WSL space Ubuntu. I'm not sure. Uh, you can get it in the Windows Store and just run that. And when it's running, you just type in Ubuntu wherever you are in the command line, and it will mount that directory inside of Linux. So you could do Linux things with your Windows stuff. Brilliant. And then a little bit about me, um, as Santosh said at the start, that uh, you know, I, I'm a dad, mentor, teacher, business owner, podcaster, developer, in that order, right? So the most important things are the dad, mentor, teacher bit, and then I do some development stuff later. Um, I did get given the Microsoft MVP, which is just here, which I'm incredibly proud of. And if you're interested, um, you can find out more about me um, by going to the .NET Core .show, wafflingtailors.rocks, or tabsandspaces.io. Um, I also hang around because Jay-Z is in the, in the group. I also hang around in the, um, the Coding Blocks Slack. So if you're aware of the Coding Blocks uh, podcast, check out their Slack. With, um, with tabs and spaces, we've got a Discord, and there's people coming in and going all the time. And we do like live streams of apps that we're working on, or I did a live stream of this talk last night, got some feedback from them. We do video gaming nights, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, definitely check that out. And then there are some links here. Um, the one that I didn't get to that I didn't go into so far are DistroWatch. If you really want to know about all of the new stuff that's happening in Linux, the great place to go because this is like a news site that combines it all for you. It is a bit um, overwhelming at the at the start when you start looking at it, but you can actually see like which oh, which excuse me which um, Linux distributions are the most popular. And so you can say, oh, well, this one's, you know, MX Linux, what's this? This seems pretty popular. I might give this a go because if it's popular, it's probably got a lot of support. And it tells you when it was last updated and it tells you all the different things that, that, that it supports and stuff like that. And another one is uh, this Linux, uh, sorry, this Reddit, this subreddit. 
Again, it's subred it's it's Reddit, right? So proceed with caution. <laughs> I don't mean that as a negative thing towards Lil uh, towards Reddit, but Reddit can be a little bit um uh upsetting sometimes. Uh the Linux for noobs, don't be put off by the name, but the Linux for noobs section of Reddit is wonderful. Um there is so much support there for people who are like, I have installed Ubuntu and I don't know how to do this. Someone will jump in and say, Okay, cool, right, talk me through it and and we'll talk you through getting this installed. And there's talks about uh, how do I pitch which distro. I'm so I'm coming from Windows 10. How, which one do I use? How do I get my games running? It's a really good um, subreddit. So that's worth checking out. And I'm uh, I'll, I'll answer your question in a second, Jay, <laughs> uh, 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 Joe. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more about me. I'm available on Twitter, as Santosh said in the intro, podcaster J. This is a picture of me when I went to Japan just before the global unfortunateness, and I, I poked a stone statue in the nose. Um, so if you see that, that's me. Um, and yeah, so that's, I'll, I'll keep those there. And I will answer, I'll answer your question now, uh, Jay-Z. Do I use Rider or, Visu or Visual Studio Code for C-Sharp these days? I tend to use both. I flip between one and the other. There are some things that, uh, so so I'm very much a case of use the tool that works best for you, right? The tool has to work for you. And so there are things that I can do really quickly in Visual Studio Code. Like uh, I, I, find, I personally find debugging difficult in Visual Studio Code, but I find it a breeze in Rider. But that's just my my own personal taste, right? You may find that Rider is, is not so good and that you prefer Visual Studio Code. It's completely up to you. I realize we've gone over a little bit, so I'm going to try and wrap up real quick. Um, but these these slides are all available on GitHub. There is a link there to them. I'll put it into the chat now so you can go and steal the slides if you like. Um, and uh, all of these links are embedded into the slides. It is just HTML. So if I go uh, inspect and I bring this up, it is quite literally just HTML, all, all embedded in, in there. So, uh, you know, and you can even find my, my comments inside of the HTML. So do definitely go check those out if you like. I'm going to shut up now and hand back to Santosh because I've been talking for way too long. <laughs> no, this was a great and great talk, Jay. I think thanks for joining us and, you know, uh, giving this talk. Uh, I did, uh, you know, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on my question. I guess, you know, when we talked about uh, techniques that span across multiple distros, I was wondering like if there are certain .NET uh, like gotchas that uh, happen uh, that or that you could or there are certain tips that work on all the distros. You know, that's I, I was I was just curious from you know writing C sharp code like if I wrote a console app or something, should I not access the file system a certain way? You know that that I guess that's kind of the thing I was looking for. Sure. Um, so, yeah. So accessing the file system, uh, I would use. I would make sure to use all of the uh, the built-in .NET stuff. Uh, so use path.join. That's really useful for for. I mean, you'll know yourself, but that avoids that problem of backslashes and forward slashes and those kind of things. Um, and it also um, you can use uh, the directory stuff. File.get. File.write. All of that is encapsulated and taken care of for you. There will be certain areas of the file system you can't write to or can't easily write to. Like for instance, you're not really supposed to write to, I showed you that uh, random area, right? Mm -hmm. You're not really supposed to write to that. That's something the system will write to constantly. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the algorithm is, it works out how long the system has been running for, how far you've moved your mouse, um, a couple of things to do with uh, how long certain applications have been running, and it captures random data from the CPU, like uh, voltage spikes and things like that, and then um, does some maths on that and then creates a, a value. So you don't want to be writing to that area. But most places you can just write to. Um, there are there are areas like uh, if I, let's see, I wonder whether I can, whether I can do it. If I, if I share my, Uh oh, did we lose Jamie? I I think so. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>